All right, now that we've established what the causes of amenorrhea are, let's talk about how we can work this up, how we can figure out what it is that our patient actually has. Patient comes in, hasn't had a period, how do we figure out what the underlying cause is? First off, let's talk about how we would work up primary amenorrhea. Patients never had a period before. What we would want to do first is a pelvic exam. The pelvic exam would tell us many things. First of all, before you even get into it, before you even complete the pelvic exam, you're going to be able to tell if you've got a transverse vaginal septum or a uh, imperforate hymen. Pelvic exam is also going to tell you if you've got a uterus or not. If there's no uterus, then you know that you're working with either malaria and agenesis or androgen insensitivity syndrome. You could do a uh, karyotype to figure out which one it is. If the uh, karyotype shows uh, XX, you know it's malaria and agenesis. If the karyotype shows XY, then you know it's probably androgen insensitivity syndrome. Let's say there is a uterus. If there is a uterus, then that means that the problem has to be hormonal. Because if there's a uterus and you have the right hormones, the uterus is going to respond. Question is, which hormone? Is it uh, progesterone or estrogen or both? The easiest way to start out looking into this is to examine the patient and see if she has breasts present. Because breasts are the surest indication of the presence of estrogen. You can grow breasts without progesterone but having estrogen, but you can't grow breasts without estrogen. If the patient has breasts, then that means she has estrogen, and, and you could do something like a progestin challenge test. Uh, to see exactly what's going on, but the likelihood of this scenario is not very high. Uh, in all likelihood, uh, with a patient with primary amenorrhea, you're going to be looking at an absence of breasts and a lack of estrogen. The only question is, where did this lack of estrogen come from? Is it at the ovaries? A lack of follicles to, uh, to respond? Or is it at the hypothalamus or pituitary, a lack of FSH being put out uh, to make the follicles respond? The best way to find out is to check the level of FSH. If the FSH is high, then you know that the problem has to be with the ovaries. Because FSH is knocking loud and clear but the follicles aren't answering. They're not uh, responding with the, uh, with the production of estrogen. So there are no follicles, probably no ovaries, probably what you're looking at is Turner. If FSH is low, then you know the problem is up here somewhere. And the only thing that we have up here the main thing we're looking at with primary amenorrhea is Kalman syndrome. To diagnose the Kalman for sure, best thing to do might be an MRI. Because remember, with Kalman syndrome, you not only have a lack of the GnRH uh, cells in the hypothalamus, you also had a failure of the olfactory nerves to migrate to the olfactory cortex. And the MRI, will for sure be able to pick up uh, defects in the olfactory cortex if you've got Coleman. Okay, so that covers primary amenorrhea. Now let's talk about how we could work up secondary amenorrhea. With secondary amenorrhea, the first thing you're going to want to check is beta-HCG. 
because the number one reason a patient who used to have periods is going to stop having them is pregnancy. If beta HCG is negative, then what you want to do is check prolactin and check TSH. Because prolactin and TSH are nice, cheap, easy tests to do, and you can easily eliminate hypothyroidism or prolactinoma with them. If both TSH and prolactin are negative, then you're going to do something called a progestin challenge test. What this involves is giving a patient progesterone for seven days and uh, then withdrawing that progesterone and seeing if it generates a menstrual period. If the patient has a menstrual period after a progesterone challenge test, then you know that progesterone was what was missing. Everything else up to that point had to be working fine. If progesterone was what was missing, then you know that it had to be from a lack of a corpus luteum, probably from a lack of the proper development of the follicle to begin with, and in all likelihood from something like polycystic ovarian syndrome, which we established earlier, impeded the final development of the follicle so that it couldn't spit out the egg and form the corpus luteum. So we're probably looking at PCOS. And we could verify by, for one thing, checking androgen levels. Because in a patient with PCOS, since they have this really high luteinizing hormone level, and that's making their theca cells make a bunch of androgens, their androgen level is going to be high. Another way we could verify it is to use an ultrasound machine and check to see if the uh, ovarian surface architecture is distorted by a bunch of cysts because you get a lot of uh, you got, get a lot of cysts from these atretic follicles uh, in the PCOS. If progesterone challenge test is negative, then there's a couple of things that could be going on. One thing is we might have a problem with outflow. And another thing is we might have a lack of estrogen. So the endometrium never proliferated to begin with, so that the progesterone would have something to work with. How do we, uh, so how are we going to figure out which one it is? The answer is we're going to give both estrogen and progesterone. We give the patient both and then withdraw the progesterone. If you give the uterus both estrogen and progesterone, the endometrium is absolutely going to develop. You pull back the progesterone and it's absolutely going to slough. If you provide both of these hormones and you still don't get a menstrual period, it's a sure thing, it's a lock, that what you're dealing with is an obstructive problem like Asherman or cervical stenosis. And you're probably looking at Asherman syndrome because cervical stenosis you would pick up on uh, doing a simple uh, pelvic exam. So if the uh, estrogen progesterone test is negative, you don't get a bleed, you're looking at an obstruction. If the estrogen progesterone test is positive, then you know you're dealing with an estrogen deficiency because you already tried progesterone on its own and it didn't work. The only new thing is you're adding estrogen. If estrogen progesterone works, it's estrogen that's deficient. The only question is, is, uh, is the problem here at the ovary or is it up above the ovary? And here, FSH levels are going to be what's going to help us out. We'll check FSH. If the FSH is high, then we know that the problem is at the ovary because FSH is, uh, is knocking but nobody's answering, no follicles there to answer. It's going to be premature ovarian failure.
if FSH is low, then we know that the problem is up here. And we've already eliminated hypothyroidism, and we've eliminated uh, prolactinoma with our earlier, uh, with our earlier tests for uh, prolactin and TSH. So the only things that are remaining in the uh, pituitary area is adenoma, and in the hypothalamus area is stress anorexia and uh, exercise. How do we distinguish? We're going to do an MRI. Because an MRI will tell us if we've got a non-functioning adenoma. If the MRI is negative, then what we're left with is a functional problem like stress or anorexia or exercise, and that's what we're going to be dealing with. All right, that wraps it up for the, uh, the workup of amenorrhea, and I hope this has helped, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you.